Welcome to Topics in Digital Economics. My name is Paul Belflam. In this video, I would like to give you a brief economic analysis of asymmetric information problems. Recall that there are two typical asymmetric information problems. One is called adverse selection. It's a problem of hidden information. Here, the seller, the firm, doesn't choose the quality of the good itself, but decides whether or not to put the good on the market the problem, as we will see, is that the market may unravel. Now, there is a second asymmetric information problem, which is called moral hazard. Here we have a problem of hidden action, and this corresponds to a situation where the firm chooses the quality of the good itself, and we will see that the main problem here is an insufficient provision of quality. So we want to go through two simplified models to give some meaning to these two problems, and then we'll discuss some of the solutions that sellers can bring to try and alleviate these problems. So let us start with a hidden information problem and with a very simple example. So we have a, one seller and many consumers. Suppose that all these consumers are identical and they decide to buy one unit of the product or they don't buy. Okay, and there are two possible qualities for the product, high or low, and before the game starts, nature decides which quality the seller will be able to offer. Okay, so for now we assume that the seller doesn't choose the quality of the product. We will see later in the second model what happens when it does chooses the uh, quality. So here, the seller observes the quality of the product, but the buyers don't observe it. So there is a situation of asymmetric information. And because buyers do, don't know the quality of the product before buying, they need to form some kind of expectation. And here we suppose that a priori, they believe that each quality is as likely to be on sale. Okay, so that's the, the, the assumption, the hypothesis uh, we take to start our analysis. Now, what is common knowledge uh, by the sellers and the buyers are these values here. Okay, so let's describe what this table means. Uh, if the good is of high quality, consumers are willing to pay up to 50 to acquire one unit, and the sellers would need to get at least 35 to cover their initial costs. As for the low quality, the maximum willingness to pay of the consumers is 10, and the production cost, so the minimum price that the sellers would accept to sell low quality, is 5. Okay, so keep these numbers in mind, and now we'll try to understand what happens first in the benchmark case when there is perfect information, complete information, and then we'll see what happens when there is incomplete information. So in the benchmark case, buyers do observe quality. Okay, and let me just go back to the table. We see that here the maximum price that consumers are willing to pay is always larger for both qualities, uh, larger than the minimum price sellers are willing to accept. Okay, so there will be room for negotiation here and eventually consumers will buy, which is efficient because they're willing to pay more than the price that is demanded by the seller. Okay, so trade always takes place if there is complete information, and this is efficient. Now, if there was incomplete information, so if the buyers don't observe quality, well, we said that our starting assumption is that both qualities would be on the market. Okay, so what would be the willingness to pay that consumers have for a good whose quality they don't know? Okay, so they believe that it may be high quality with 50% chance, or low quality with 10% chance. So the average valuation of a good of a known quality is the average of 50 and 10, which is 30. Okay, so this is what we record here. Their expected willingness to pay, or what they're willing to pay for a product they don't know the value of or the quality of, is in this simple case 30 per unit. Okay, but the problem, let me go back to the table, the problem is that producers of high quality goods. So if the seller has received a high quality good, well, the seller would need 35 to cover the cost of this good. But consumers, as we just saw, are just willing to pay the average of 50 and 10, which is 30. So in that case, a high quality seller wouldn't be willing to come to the market because 
this seller is not going to receive a price sufficiently large to cover the production cost. Okay, so this is where the market starts to unravel. The consumers realize that if they believe that both qualities would be on the market, they would be willing to pay only 30, but this price is not large enough to convince high quality sellers to be on the market. So they've got to revise their initial beliefs and they will rightly think that only low quality uh, goods will be offered on the market. And in that case, let me go back once more to the table. In that case, if they believe that with 100% chance the products on the market will be low quality, then they're willing to pay 10 and 10 is large enough to convince low quality sellers to be on the market. So the equilibrium will be that only low quality sellers show up on the market and they will actually uh, sell their goods because what they ask, a price of minimum price of five, is lower than what the consumers are willing to pay, uh, which is 10 in this case. We call this situation adverse selection because Actually, the low quality will drive the good quality out of the market. Okay, there is a selection of qualities, but this is adverse because only the low quality stays on the market. And this is inefficient because, as we saw here, if there was complete information, a good of high quality would be sold on the market. Okay, so this simplified example is a simple version of a, uh, a more general model that has been proposed by George Akerlof, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. And he, he won the Nobel Prize for all his work on information economics, which started with this article here, The Market for Lemons, Quality, Uncertainty and the Market Mechanism. Uh, lemons, for those who don't know, is the, uh, the name for used second and cars or used cars of uh, bad quality. Okay, and so you can generalize what we have just seen to uh, an arbitrary number of qualities and you would get the same uh, equilibrium result as the one we showed, which is the market unraveling. Only the lowest quality would remain on the market. Okay, so now let's move to perhaps a more realistic setting where the firm is choosing itself the quality. So we, we keep, keep the same numbers, but you can think of this production cost as the result of a decision of the seller to invest whether or not to pay to, to sell the high quality. Okay, uh, so it's not something which is inherited by the, the seller, but is, this is a decision. Okay, otherwise the, the model remains the same. Now, in a sense, things get worse, right? Because given what we have just seen um, and given that there is no way for the seller to convince consumers that uh, the seller is actually producing high quality, uh, why would the seller pay a larger cost of 35 if consumers cannot be convinced to pay 50? Okay, so this is basically the, the, the intuition here. Let's just uh, do this more formally. Well, if there is complete information, again, this is our benchmark. Well, the seller would choose to market the high quality rather than the low quality because there is a higher margin that can be made there. Okay, so the margin for high quality is 50 minus 35, 15, which is larger than the margin for the low quality, which is just 10 minus 5. Okay, and so if we, uh, if we assume, and this is the case here, that all consumers are the same, in economic terms it means that the, the demand is inelastic, well it gives tremendous market power to the seller uh, who is in a position to set the largest possible price just below the pain point of the consumers, in this case that would be one cent short of 50. Okay, and this is efficient again because the gains of trade are maximized. Now, the interesting situation for us is incomplete information when buyers don't observe the quality. And as I said before, the seller has no means to convince consumers that she produces the high quality. Okay, Because any price she would quote which is below 50 could also have been quoted by a seller producing the lower quality. Okay, so uh, this is a term we will use later. The low quality producer can mimic a high quality producer. Okay, so consumers cannot make a difference, and so there is no way 
a high potential high quality seller would obtain a price above 35 and so the investment is not worth it meaning that at equilibrium all sellers decide to sell the low quality and we have the same problem as before this is called moral hazard here because it results from the choice of the uh, of the sellers sorry and this choice the investment decision is not observable by the seller by the buyers sorry Okay, so how can we get out of this problem? Okay, well, there are ways to uh, alleviate the problem, but this would be costly. Okay, and we concentrate here on two um, decisions that sellers can make to try and solve the problem. Okay, so it's important to stress here that it's not because the asymmetry of information is such that buyers know less than sellers, that sellers are in a strong position, actually sellers suffer as, as much as buyers from the market failure due to asymmetric information. Okay, so it makes sense for sellers to make costly actions to try and solve the problem and improve the, the working of the market. Okay, one such uh, mechanism is signaling. Okay, what is signaling in a few words? Well, think of a situation of repeat, repeated purchases. Okay, so the, the buyers uh, can buy repeatedly from, from the seller. Okay, and so in that situation, it may be possible for the seller to convince consumers that she actually produces the high quality. And how can she do that? She needs to take a certain action, which is costly enough that, in a sense, the consumers will understand that only a producer of high quality would find it profitable to make such a costly action. Okay, In reverse, a producer of low quality would not find it profitable to make such an action. Okay, So let's read the definition together here. For an action to be a signal, consumers must believe that this action could only have been taken by a seller producing the good quality, and this belief must eventually be confirmed by the seller's behavior. Okay, so not only consumers have to believe that this action can only be made by a high-quality seller, but the high-quality seller, given that the consumers believe that, must also find it profitable to make this action. And also, at the same time, a low-quality producer shouldn't find this action profitable. Okay, so one example of such action would be a, a very large marketing expenditure or large adv ad advertising expenditure. Okay, and this, this advertising doesn't need to give any information of, about the product directly, but it will do so indirectly just by showing that it's such an expensive advertising campaign that only high quality producers who can secure high profits in the long run because they will be recognized as high quality producers, so only high quality producers can afford this kind of very expensive advertising. Okay, and the same argument goes for warranties that some of them may be uh, legal, so you have to give one or two years of warranties, but above that, sellers may decide to spend money offering extended warranty. And again, as this is perceived as costly by consumers, consumers will figure out that only a high quality seller would actually afford this kind of extended warranty because the low quality sellers would eventually have to pay warranties make and, and, and lose money because of that. Okay, and so this wouldn't be profitable for a low quality sellers to offer an extended warranty. Right, so signaling may uh, be a way for high quality producers to signal themselves to convince consumers that they do indeed produce high quality, but they need to incur some kind of costly investment to realize this. Now, a second uh, way through which um, high quality producers can convince consumers is through reputation. Okay, And here we use a slightly different setting. So in the previous setting we were talking about repeated purchases in the sense that a consumer buys repeatedly from the same firm. Okay, but the decision to produce high quality was made once and for all. 
okay, and was observed after the first purchase by the consumers. And once the consumers had seen that the good was of high quality, they knew that they would receive high quality in the future. Now, there are many situations where uh, even though a consumer has received high quality today, there is still a doubt about the, the level of quality that the consumer will receive in the future. Okay, so firms in many uh, situations have to invest again and again in the quality of their products. Why? Because the, the features of the product may change, for example, or they may change suppliers. So they've got to convince consumers in every period that they do indeed produce high quality. Okay, and so the problem is, is more acute here because the seller will repeatedly face the consumer's lack of confidence. Okay, nevertheless, there is a way by which a firm can convince consumers that it does actually produce high quality repeatedly. Okay, and this can be done by building a reputation of high quality producer. Okay, and a brand or a trademark may be a way to um, encompass this a reputation for high quality. Okay, so let me now um, change the model a little bit to, to, to give you a formal argument as to how this can uh, be done. Okay, so we still have the same game as before, but it's repeated through time. Okay, we don't know whether uh, this is going to end uh, at some period, so consumers and sellers s believe that there is always a chance that they will interact again in the next period. Okay, and differently uh, from what I had, uh, had described uh, so far, the seller has to choose the quality and the price of the product at every period. Okay, now what changes from the previous uh, setting is that the consumer's beliefs about the produced quality can now depend on the seller's past behavior. Okay, so as a consumer, I will look at what the seller has done so far to formulate my beliefs about what the seller will do in the future. Okay, and one realistic assumption is to say the consumers first give the benefit of the doubt. Okay, they say, well, the, the seller says he's producing a high quality, let's, let me believe her, but... If I observe at some point that I receive low quality rather than high quality, then I'll never trust this seller again, and I will believe forever that this seller is producing low quality. Okay, and so we will see that based on this kind of beliefs, which uh, kind of give a, a, a very large cost to the seller if the seller deviates from the high quality, based on that, uh, we can have sellers being disciplined in a sense, offering high quality in every period, and consumers believing that they will continue to produce high quality. Okay, so that illustrates this idea of a reputation that took decades to build, but can be threatened by a single event. Okay, so the fact that consumers know that a single event can blow the reputation of the seller, and the seller knowing this as well, well, all this may work towards a repeated equilibrium where high quality is offered period after period. Okay, so here is the formalization. I keep the same numbers as before. High quality has a value of 50 for consumers and low quality has a value of 10. And in terms of cost, it costs 35 to produce one unit of high quality and just five to produce a unit of low quality. Okay, and consumers, let's say, give the benefit of the doubt to the seller in the first period, they believe that they will receive high quality and so they're willing to pay up to 50. Okay, and period after period, as long as they receive high quality again and again, they're still willing to pay that price. But if they receive low quality at one period, so they will discover at the end of the period that they have received low quality, it's an experience good, remember, um, then they will somehow punish the firm, and they will never again believe that this firm produces high quality, meaning that what they will be willing to pay for the product is just 10. Now, what would the firm decide, given the, the way the consumers form their beliefs? Okay, well, here the game is repeated again and again. 
Okay, so at a, any given point in time, and let's start at a point where so far the firm has sold high quality in every period. Well, at a given period like this, the firm has to decide whether to continue selling high quality, which will mean that in the next period it can get a high price of 50, or whether it would deviate by producing the low quality still under the belief of the consumers that this is high quality which is put on the market. Okay, so we need to think in terms of flow of profits from now up to the future and if we want to compare the flow of profits that the two decisions of the uh, sellers can bring, well we need to have a common way to uh, compare these profits and this is why we, we use the present discounted value. Okay, so let's just take an, a numerical example here, which is simple enough. It doesn't claim to be realistic. Suppose that the seller can get a return of 25% on, uh, on, on the money it puts on the bank or in any type of uh, financial uh, account. Um, so that means that if the seller has 100 pounds today, um, this is worth 125 tomorrow. So if you reverse the argument, it means that the value of receiving 100 tomorrow the next period are worth 80 today, which is you divide instead of multiplying by 1.25, 1, 1 you divide by 1.25. Okay, now what is the present discounted value of profit if the seller keeps on offering the high quality? Well, consumers will continue to believe that uh, they receive high quality, so they're willing to pay 50. The cost of producing a unit of high quality is 35. Remember, we are in a situation where uh, the seller has all the bargaining power and so the seller can set a price of 50 and make a margin of 15 um, today, but also tomorrow, the day after tomorrow and so on and so forth. Of course, the margin of 15 to be received today is discounted by 0.8 the margin of 15 to be received the day after tomorrow is divided by 0.8 times 0.8 and so on and so forth. I've got an infinite sum and for those of you who like math you may remember the formula of an infinite sum and in that case it would be 1 over divided by um, 1 by 0.8 is that true? Um, by 0.2 sorry 1 divided by 0.2 which is 5 and that multiplies 50 minus uh, 35, so it gets uh, 55. This is the total present discounted value of keeping offering the high quality. Okay. Now, the the other the alternative would be to deviate and to start offering the low quality. There is an immediate gain, of course, because you can fool the consumers. They they still believe that you produce high quality, so they're willing to pay 50, and this is the price at which you can sell one unit. But of course, it's much less costly to produce a unit of low quality, and so you would make a margin today of 45 instead of 15. Okay, but consumers at the next period will realize that you have fooled them, okay, and they will start believing that you are a low quality producer for um, forever. Okay, they will never be willing to pay 50 again, they're willing to pay 10, because they're willing to pay 10, you don't have an incentive to produce the high quality, so you will produce the low quality and you will make a margin of 5 tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so on and so forth. If you compute the value of this infinite sum of profits, while well, you get 45 today and starting tomorrow, and this is why you have to multiply by 4 here, you get a margin of 5. In my example, that leads you to a lower present discounted value of profit. So it's better for you Given uh, the value uh, you can have from the money you put on the bank, so given your discounting factor, and given also the preferences of the consumers and the cost of the different uh, qualities, well, in this case, it's better to keep on um, offering the high quality to maintain your reputation. Okay, What you would lose by f uh, fooling the consumers today is more than offset, but let me say that again, what you would win, sorry, by fooling the consumers today is more than offset by what you would lose by losing your reputation of high quality. Okay, so in this case, we have an equilibrium where the seller always offers, offers the high quality 
And I repeat, this is because the loss of a reputation in the long term weighs more than the short term gain of selling the low quality at the price of the high quality. Right, so let's, let me summarize. We have seen that asymmetric information causes market failure. There are two types of problems. There is hidden information situations that lead to adverse selection. There are also hidden action situations that lead to moral hazards. And we have seen that costly signaling by sellers may alleviate asymmetric information problems, whereas uh, reputation concerns can also alleviate uh, in, uh, asymmetric information problems in a repeated inter interaction context. If you want to read more about this, you can uh, read chapter 12 in uh, our textbook. Otherwise, that's it for now. Thank you.